This is the talk of Music City Real Estate. Welcome back to another episode of the Talk of Music City Real Estate. Where we educate and motivate all things real estate. My name is Monty Moore with Realty One Group Music City. Hey, and I'm Carrie Ann with CMG Financial and my mortgage team. Every week we'll be posting a new episode chock full of Nashville real estate value. Yes, and you can follow along and subscribe at talkmusiccity.com. Got a question for us? Ask away at questions at talkmusiccity.com. That's questions at talkmusiccity.com. Monty. Carrie Ann, good to see you back. Jason. Hey. In the studio. How's Jason's going? back. We got a supersonic guest today. We do, we do. Before we introduce our guest, so I want to share a real quick story. So in nineteen quick, he said. This is this is probably <laughs> before you were on the maybe I don't think you were even on the planet yet, Carrie Ann. This is in back in the early nineteen eighties, okay? Wait a minute. Yeah. <laughs> this, this is sort of like going to I am twenty nine. <laughs> I am like, twenty nine. So saying. hey. That's, that's what I'm saying. Is, you know, like so, the of Sicily. So, what are you talking about over there? So, so this guy with a high school education here, um, you know, finds himself in Florida selling real estate because the broker down there said, "I'll bet you can make thirty thousand dollars a year." And I got so excited about making thirty thousand dollars a year, I moved my family from Illinois to to Florida to sell real estate. Well, the first year I didn't make thirty thousand. I'd sold some things, but mainly stuff out of the garage. But by that second year. I was starting to build up some momentum, okay? And I, somebody said, I'll bet you could make a six-figure income. And I said, what's a six-figure income? I wrote it down and said, damn, that'd be a lot of money. <laughs> well, then, then unfortunately for me, somebody had given me a, 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 a set of tapes from Zig Ziglar. And so I reverse engineered, what, how do I make $100,000 when your average sale price is $64,000 and I'm on a 50-50 split? Well, my goodness, that's 100 homes. I can sell 100 homes. Anyhow, the, the point of the story here today is, I made that, I made $111,000. I stayed focused on the goals that I had before me. But my point is, I thought, because I'd only worked in blue collar America, I thought when I got that money, that money was mine. Yes. And I spent that <laughs> money. Should be. Okay. I bought, I bought a house with no money down that, that year. I bought a boat. I actually bought two boats, a fishing boat and a pleasure boat. I bought a new van and I bought a new car, all with no money down because... That was my money, I thought. It had always been my money in the past when I got it. I didn't know I had to share it with the government. Well, anyway, we today have an awesome uh, CPA with us who's going to talk about us, about, to us about working smarter, not just harder, but smarter. Is that too, true, Michael Carter of Carter Financial? That's correct. So every welcome year- to, we Welcome have, with us, to us, you. brother. Thank with you. Us. Every year when, when I meet with clients, they always ask me two questions. If I made that much, how come uh, I don't have that much sitting in the bank account, mm -hmm. right? And the second question is, I have to pay the IRS how much? <laughs> right. And <laughs> it, Too much. It's, yeah, too it's much. always too, yeah, much. too much. Whether it's whether it's your ordinary income, earned income, or capital gains, or anything like that, it's uh, it, it always ends up being a surprise visit each year. And the constant I get from clients is, you know, I only focus on this one time a year. So I need you to educate me every single year. Mm -hmm. And so at the end of the day, it's always about understanding what your landscape is gonna look like. So that usually requires quarterly planning meetings um, where you wanna meet with somebody who's qualified, somebody who understands, but also somebody who's excited to work with you, right? Somebody who understands you're not gonna know everything, but you are excited about what you do, you love what you do, and you wanna keep more of what you earn sure. because mm -hmm. you're trading a lot of time for that money. Yeah, I don't want to have to become an expert on, on various topics. I want to find an expert that I can align myself with. I went to a doctor's Amen. appointment today, and the doctor has got a, a really great reputation within the people that have referred me to him. And he's more of a natural path kind of doctor. And he said, well, will you trust me on this? I said, look, doc, I don't want to be the expert here. I want to trust somebody who is. I've made it to almost 70, doing good. I want to continue to make it to the next, you know, at least in, to a, the triple digits. And uh, still feeling good. I don't want to be in the corner. And that's going to be a party. Drooling on myself. You know, I want to be, you know, looking healthy and feeling healthy, acting healthy. I want to surround myself with people I can trust that are experts in their field. So that's that's what I, I, I that's why that's why Jason wanted to have you on here because he said, okay, this guy we can trust. He's an expert in his field, and most realtors unfortunately don't know a whole lot about economics or about getting themselves a in the right tax category so they can save some taxes. 
Yeah, I mean, and also there's so many without that knowledge that, you know, we find ourselves wasting money paying tax when we could actually mm-hmm. utilize that money when teaming up with somebody so seasoned and such a professional in his field and her field, whoever, you know, you decide to go with. Um, but you can utilize those funds to actually benefit and, and grow your business even more, right? And so I know that um, Mike Carter, again, out of Murfreesboro, love uh, your story from the beginning. You know, it was a heartfelt uh, beginning with your your company. I'd love to hear a little bit more about that. Um, um, just to kind of share the person and the heart that you have uh, within, but, you know, talking, he works with, you know, real estate agents like yourselves. Right. And so we can learn a little bit more, um, on what he is finding, um, that some of the agents out there are forgetting about. Yeah. One thing I want to hit real quick before we get into my history. Uh, I love what you said there about surrounding yourself with the right uh, advisors. Mm-hmm. Uh, the reason that's so important is you look at somebody like a Dale Carnegie, or you look at somebody like a um, uh, Henry Ford, somebody like that. It's been said about those titans of their industry mm-hmm. that they could have been in any industry because mm-hmm. of the people they had around them mm-hmm. is the reason they succeeded. Mm-hmm. So, so much more than their peers. Yeah, I don't think right? I don't, I'm not sure that Henry Ford graduated high school. Mm-mm. I did mm-hmm. that at least. But he, yeah. was, <laughs> he surrounded himself well, with people who had. Um, Carnegie, I believe, started his his career as a bookkeeper, believe it or not, yeah, which yeah. is pretty funny when you stop and think about it. His first uh, family hire was his brother, who he had as his bookkeeper for his company when he <laughs> went into his own merchant service. Mm-hmm. Um, my firm really, it started, the idea of it started in summer of 2018. <clears throat> and, and what I was doing up to that point, I was working for a firm there in Murfreesboro, and we were working on the side, which we had approval through the, through the firm owner, that we work with about 15 single parents. And, and these are usually single mothers just because of the way our society treats uh, certain situations. But what they, what they couldn't afford was a good CPA. They were, they were self, self-employed. They needed somebody that could help them kind of navigate the waters. So we worked with them at a very reduced rate. And then we went from 15, I, I ended up going full-time in January of 2019. So we just hit our three and three year, five month, five, yeah. Something, math, something. right? Yeah. It's math. Uh, <laughs> and so very quickly, I went from how am I going to feed my family to do I need to hire somebody? And it was over the course of a week and a half. Wow. And then we ended up at about 167 clients by the end of four month period. Um, at that point, I was uh, collaborating with a couple of CPAs. I wanted to, wanted to help other people understand how I set my firm up for that success, but I didn't realize yet how successful that really was until I started talking to some of these sole proprietors who'd been in business for five years that still only had the same amount of clients I had already achieved in four months. So it let me know I'm onto something. Now I'm a military mindset, so everything I do has a process. We have a checklist for everything. I don't have to hire and then train. I hire and then point to a checklist, and everybody can do what I do. He's mm-hmm. speaking my love language. <laughs> <laughs> and it's very important because if you don't have the process in place, yeah. you own a job. You don't own a business mm-hmm. yet, mm-hmm. right? And that's that's very important. So when you start looking into how do I own a business, that's where you bring in the right people Mm -hmm. so that you can delegate. And Mm -hmm. that's where you bring in the right advisors. So you don't have to be the expert in everything. Mm -hmm. You just have to be the expert in what produces income. Sure. Mm -hmm. Right. And then it's up to some of those advisors to teach you how to either compound that income or keep more of it. Mm -hmm. And that's where we step in. Yeah. So how'd you get to know him? How'd you, you know, refer him? You guys are using him yourself, I guess. Oh yeah, absolutely. And, um, uh, it was through, um, uh, another acquaintance mm-hmm. of ours that, well, he was on the show. Um, uh, okay, I know you're talking about. Oh my goodness, now yeah. I'm on the spot. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Young um, guy. An amazing person <laughs> who was on our show who referred uh, who, who this recom- other amazing person. Who recommended uh, who was gonna do Financial advisor? Yeah. Brock Fortner? No. Uh, uh, it's right on the through or something maybe. That's okay. So anyway, let's yeah. talk about those those <laughs> folks. So you being self employed, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, Mindy as well, your beautiful wife. Um, so a true self employed you know, family. Dylan Smith. Dylan Smith. I was buying Dylan you. Time. I was buying you some dead space Thank there. Thank you. Yeah. I appreciate it. Um, but going back to that, right? And so you work with quite a few folks that maybe file a Schedule C. Yeah, so it's it's actually that that number is dwindling down quite a bit. So as as we see more and more uh, business owners start getting above that seventy five thousand dollar threshold as far as net income goes, we start recommending different strategies because now they're no longer in the most efficient vehicle for them. Uh, before that, in any other state, and keep this in mind, in any other state, that income level is fifty thousand. 
in Tennessee, New Hampshire, New York, it's slightly higher because we have state tax issues that do apply to S corps. Mm. So um, <clears throat> that's where we, we have a bit of a, and, and you have to understand how I look at that is if I can save you $10,000 but you're paying me $10,000, have I truly saved you a dollar or did I just save you money on taxes? Mm -hmm. I've, right. I've done what you've asked me to do, I Mike. I need to, I need to save money on taxes, right? That's the common thing I hear from clients. Mm -hmm. No, you don't. You don't care how much you pay the IRS. You just want to know it was the least amount you had to, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And so if I save you 10,000, but you pay my firm a fee of 10,000, you didn't save anything. You shifted who you paid. That's all. Right, right. So I don't recommend a strategy until I know it puts an extra dollar in the client's pocket because that's what truly matters. That's how I'm going to be graded. And quite frankly, that's the only thing you really do to add value. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. So you're saying that a lot of those real estate agents and or self-employed that hit over that $75,000 threshold, you are converting over to a different model. We're at least having the discussion. Okay. Because the discussion is, is meant, we do three things in, in, in my firm. We share your risk meaning we're going to understand where you are. And that's something you need from a CPA. As a CPA, I'll tell you exactly what I look for in every CPA if I were to find my own. Mm -hmm. I'm going to look for somebody that shares the risk tolerance because it does you no good if your CPA knows the entire tax code, which they don't. I'll promise you that right off the bat. It changes too often. But even if they did, but they're not willing to go to bat because some of these strategies require legwork, right? If they're not willing to do that and they're not willing to share in that risk, mm -hmm. you're, you're, you're already losing value with them. Then if they're not willing to educate you, right? And the education on that is not only that you're gonna save money on taxes, but how, why do you meet the code? How do you beat it if the IRS comes looking? Because there's nothing wrong with an audit, to be honest. There's just not. I don't like them. <laughs> I've been through three of them, I don't like them. Oh, you've been through, through more than three, I'll almost guarantee it. So every time you receive a notice from the IRS, it's a correspondence audit. A field audit is the one that everybody reverts uh, to as that true had, audit, right? I like that. And, and even even still, they're not that bad as long as you didn't lie or as long as you no, have they, the documentation, No, they, they really weren't right? that, they were bigger in my mind than they were right. in real life. And yeah. so the fear keeps you, and, mm -hmm. and the fear makes you do things and reach out to CPAs that you may not necessarily need to work with just because you didn't have any other options, right? And so, your CPA should be educating you on what's going to happen through that process. I'm going through an audit right now with a client who <laughs> I had to find some wood there just a second, sorry. Who wasn't a client under the year of audit, but because he kept such good records, it's we're speeding through it. It's not a problem at all. We don't mm -hmm. even have to meet with the with, with the, uh, right. the revenue officer, right? And so that's the second thing. You want somebody who's going to educate you because it's not good enough if the IRS ever calls you and says, "Hey, Why'd you take this tax position? Oh, you know, we wanted to save money on taxes. They're going to disallow it. You have to have a mm -hmm. business reason. And that's what my clients understand. We, we tell them what the business reason is. Now, we don't need you to understand all of the details, mm -hmm. but you need to understand the underlying business reason for taking that, that strategy. Mm -hmm. uh, and then the third thing is you want somebody you can communicate with. If you dread your, your conversation with your accountant every year, you're disincentivized to go talk to your sure. accountant in the middle of the year sure. when things happen, when things can be changed. Sure. If your accountant finds out about things at the end of the year, it's already too late. It's mm -hmm. happened, mm -hmm. right? Now you're left with the end of year tax strategies. Or let me rephrase that: end of year tax planning. End of year tax planning. I hate. It's it's the worst claim on planning on the planet. What Fourth is, quarter is, strategy. All, all you're doing is you're planning for what you're going to already owe, right? right and the right only on. way to impact or affect that number is to either spend money on things you don't really care to spend your money on mm -hmm. or lock it up in an account where you don't get to touch it. Mm -hmm. That's a problem for people who need their money for their lifestyle, right? Mm -hmm. So your, your end of year tax planning, that is just a way for your CPA to get more money, right? Mm -hmm. So when, when we have a new client come in, what we end up doing is we, we provide three different uh three different tax returns. We give you what actually happened. We give you what could have happened if you maximized every available tool you had today. Mm -hmm. And then we show you where we want you to be in the future and how much oh, you're gonna save like based that. on that. That's good. Um, that, yeah, that's, I mean, that's usually what we have. And, and that usually leads to that discussion about the S Corp and why that's the most efficient vehicle. And then we add on tax strategies on top of that, right? So there's some that we already build into it. And then there's more if, if we have those tax planning meetings or tax mm -hmm. strategy meetings or, mm -hmm. or what I call them, uh, that's where we start building on, okay, you didn't meet this last year, but you meet it this year. Let's get it in place. So let's talk about the real estate agent who does make 75,000 or less. We're in a market where the world shifted a little bit. So they're mm -hmm. not, you know, the inventory is not as grand. So let's, so what are the best strategies for a real estate agent, 75,000 or less? Biggest issue I see is not keeping up with actual expenses. So not having a program like QuickBooks in place, right? Okay. You can get by with Excel for so long. 
once you have enough transactions now, you're meeting clients regularly, you're having those meals regularly, you're, you're swiping that card pretty regularly, you're going to forget. Or you're going to get so backed up, you're going to bring me a tote at the end of the year, and that is not fun <laughs> for me, <laughs> right? Because I'll almost guarantee you, you bring me a tote this big, and it's happened, it's always realtors, one, <laughs> one, uh, one therapist. It was me before they took that there, away. There was one therapist, but I almost guarantee you, you're going to forget about something, and what you've brought me, only 5% is going to actually go on the tax return. Mm-hmm. So I'm going to be spending a lot of my time on stuff that doesn't mm-hmm. matter, wow. right? So where we could have been spending a lot of time talking about strategy, so strategy is forward thinking, not just reverse thinking of, mm-hmm. okay, this is what happened, this is how much we're going to owe based on this, and let's get our quarterly payments lined up, right? If you owe the IRS $50,000 by the end of the year, you know how much penalty you're getting uh, put on that money for you to use it throughout the year? It's ugly. I know that. No, it's so. it's less than $1,000. You can't the borrow penalty? money cheaper oh, than okay. that. Oh, okay. Okay. The penalty of, yeah, of that, that year. Okay. Yeah, okay. you're right. I thought you so meant you after a few years. <laughs> yeah. So you lock that money up in a, in a money market account. You're earning more than you're sure, paying the sure, IRS. Sure. So it makes more sense for you to keep it, right? Right. So we never, we never tell our clients unless they just can't stomach the big bill at the end of the year and they, they're not really good savers. Don't send the IRS money early. Mm-hmm. Put it to work somewhere else. What about um, even sending it later? Is the penalty quite a bit? No, that's as long as you pay it by April 18th, that's that's the catch. Now, mm-hmm. if you pay it after April 18th, yeah, on if, your you extension. Don't, if you don't file an extension, you get failure to file penalty. Now, that is up to 25% of the tax due. That's mm-hmm. the big problem. The extension mm-hmm. wipes that away, mm-hmm. and then you have to October, right? The payment was still due on April 18th. So right now, $50,000, you are paying somewhere, I think, uh, couple of the tax uh, returns we've been doing lately, about 50,000 owed results in probably four or $500 in taxes or in penalty and interest right now. Just to, so you properly extend my return and mm-hmm. then I wait till October. Mm-hmm. And the penalty between April and October is minimal. Minimal. It's so again, thousand, thinking thousand. like, I, I do think, you know, we want people excited about paying their bills. I'm in the lending world, so I think it's important uh, that because it's really a struggle, you know, you as the real estate agent, you know, have the buyer that's in that same pickle, right? I'm like, well, they have to pay their taxes so I can use it. I, I can only use taxable income, right? Yeah. So if they're self-employed, I'm kind of stuck. Um, but for that self-employed buyer who's not looking to purchase right now, right? I mean, it does make sense. Like I do, I file the extension and I wait, I utilize their money mm-hmm. to bent, make me more money yeah. you know in in the long run there's no reason for me to run off and give them you know all this money there's a better not. way to do it than that all right tell us tell <laughs> us write it down first first the cautionary tale right if you wait till october and you happen to miss your deadline right okay let's say you're jetting off to france and you forget that you owe this tax liability i'm headed there and so <laughs> I, we'll, 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 we'll be there on saturday so uh if you forget to make that payment that 25 percent penalty we talked about uh-huh. the day you lapse reverts back to the first day it was due and now you owe that 25 percent penalty mm. so you got to be very careful if you're waiting till that last minute sure the better model go ahead and get on a payment plan with the irs it drops your interest and penalty down to one and a half percent right so now you can actually make those payments the, the minimum payment you have to make is whatever your tax liability due divided by 72 months mm-hmm. and that's the minimum they'll accept but it drops your interest and penalty in half that's Drops automatic you don't have to negotiate that automatic wow. so you're saying wait till october and then make the the monthly you, payment you could but i would probably just go ahead and do it in and because remember between april and october you're already accruing penalty and interest now it's not the, the big penalty oh but i it see is some penalty and interest so if you want to drop that rate in half go ahead and get on the payment huh, plan cool. early and do all folks um get approved for payment plans i've not seen one denied mm-hmm. okay so again just hmm. as the lender um when utilizing the payment plan that he's referencing, which is the 72 mm-hmm. um, months, I have to use that in my debt to income ratio for qualifications. So when buyers say, oh, no, no, no worries, I got a payment plan and it, and instead of doing the 72 months, they're like, hey, I'm just gonna pay $2,000 a month just to pay it off. Mm-hmm. I have to take $2,000 and put that in their debt to income ratio. So it's something just to think about, you know, if people are that looking- That shows up purchase. somewhere? We have to get it from- from the IRS, it, it, mm-hmm. uh, it would it would have to come. So so most of the time, lenders are going to ask, okay, are you, we want proof that you paid your tax mm-hmm. liability? If you're self employed, and mm-hmm. if you can't show that, then you got to show that you're on a payment plan or mm-hmm. that you have the extension filed. And so I've seen some lenders require go ahead and make that payment, get it off the books, mm-hmm. and I've seen some that were okay with that payment plan. Mm-hmm. 
um, thing on the ratio. We're allowed mm-hmm. just for the, the yeah. payment letter, mm-hmm, approvable uh, payment letter. So that's great. Okay, so let's now talk about, um, well, let's go back to, um, so expenses of a, of a real estate agent, right? You, um, I took them to coffee, I took them to lunch, I have all of my swag, right? Uh, my gas, my car. Should I always purchase a car and put the Hoover team on the side? <laughs> so like, is, that a, is that a thing? Like you should do that? You don't have to in order to claim the car is, is business related. Okay. You don't have to do that. There may be a better way, right? Hmm. There are three ways that you can actually put your vehicle into your business. Okay. So, Tell us. Yeah. So good. <laughs> so, so there, the first way is, is what everybody's typically used to, right? Your mileage. Mm-hmm. Realtors traditionally across the U S average about 20,000 miles a year. Okay. That's their average, right? So that's about a $10,000 deduction every single year. Generally, if you write off a vehicle, you get the deduction if you use 179, if it qualifies for 179 or bonus, you can get the deduction all in the first year or spread it out over a five year period, right? After five years, you've got a relatively brand new car, right? That's gonna last you a couple hundred thousand miles, but you got relatively low maintenance costs, right? Your fuel and oil changes for the most part. Mm-hmm. So you generally don't have a whole lot of deductions left after that, mm. right? It's certainly not $10,000 worth, so right. generally for a realtor, um, you're better off taking mileage every single year, right? Now, there is a caveat, right? So you can always go from mileage to actual expenses, but you can never go from actual expenses back to mileage. So in a year mm-hmm. where you replace a transmission or you replace an engine, we want to take actual expenses, sell that car, buy a new one and elect mileage again, mm-hmm. right? Hmm. So that's what about it. my car's heavy? So if it's over six thousand pounds, then you can you can actually deduct it fully that year. That's the only that's the but only. But it changes this do. year. Hmm? Does it change this year? No, no, no. Oh, okay. What's heavy? Uh, so your car, your your car. So there's two. There's two. I uh, try to pick so up. anything I over six thousand <laughs> gross vehicle weight. Mm-hmm. So anything over six thousand or a specialty vehicle. So if you have a flatbed truck, the IRS is probably going to think you're you're not going to use that for for a daily driver, right? Mm-hmm. Most likely, you're, you're just not that silly, right? Uh, and so that will give you the full deduction in that year. Mm-hmm. Now, a specialty vehicle does not include a Roush. Raptor, right? <laughs> They're not going to look at that and say, okay, yeah, you're probably using this for business, right? No, right. Uh, now, it just so happens that does weigh over 6,000 pounds, so you get to back into that. Mm-hmm. Uh, and there are some exclusions for uh, luxury vehicles. So that is one area we still need to be aware of that, hey, it may be over 6,000 pounds, but the IRS says, uh-uh, hmm. not this year. Your vehicle is yeah, I've got an, uh, a Ford um, Expedition. There you go. Is that, mm-hmm. that qualifies, yes. Okay. But, and he doesn't have to put money on the side? You don't have to put anything on it at all. Look at that. Hmm. So that's the first way, right? M- mileage. Mileage. The second way is deduction and actual expenses. So that's where you would actually deduct 179 or bonus depreciation or just five year period, right? The third way, and this is the way my firm handles it, I rent my vehicle from, right. my, from, from my person to my escort. So that I have a business expense and then I have lease income on my personal tax return. For those who do understand the tax code, you might think, okay, the lease income operates the same way as the distribution from the S-Corp. It's already tax efficient. Why would you do that when you can already get that from the Mm S-Corp? Well, the reasonable salary portion of an S-Corp is determined by your net income, right? So if you're reducing that by a lease expense, Hmm. you're reducing your reasonable salary requirement. So you're actually getting a double benefit there. Hmm. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Hmm. So... Good stuff. Good stuff. So just to make sure I understand, I'm so sorry, Jason. So if I took mileage, I couldn't write his new truck off? That's right. You okay. have to elect one or the other. Okay. Depending on what, but and then what you're saying is um, the dep- uh, appreci- or depreciation, what is it? Depreciation. Is better for him one year, but I can't back, for, back can't go back and forth. Right. Okay. So once you, once you depreciate and, and you uh, elect your actual expenses, you can never go back to mileage on that vehicle. I got gotcha. you. Mm-hmm. Okay. Mm-hmm. That's good to, good to know. So what would you do with an $80,000 new vehicle? Would you write it off that year? Or would you, would you drive it? Uh, right now I'd sell it back to the dealers. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, you know, there are so many vehicles and, and vehicles are always advancing, right? They're always getting better and better. So as long yeah. as you're okay with the quality of your vehicle, if that's 80,000 or if that's 30,000, doesn't really matter. Mm-hmm. Right? As long as it's, it's giving you what you need from it, the utility matches what you expect, mm-hmm. right? For an $80,000 vehicle, if I'm having the, the year of my life, I'm probably writing it off and then I might even just go buy another vehicle next mm-hmm. year. Mm-hmm. My Maybe. girlfriend uh, buys one okay, every year. Okay, you can do that. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah, you can, you can write off a vehicle every year if you buy one every year. The catch, the catch. 
depreciation recapture. So let's say you take a vehicle that's supposed to be depreciated over a five-year period and you accelerate that depreciation into year one. Mm -hmm. The calculation for the depreciation still occurs over a five-year period. So if you sell it in year two, you've written off year two, three, four, and five. So you have to recapture that. Mm -hmm. So that comes back on the books. Mm -hmm. Now it comes back on the books at a maximum, I think 28%. So you still might be in a better tax bracket on that income, wow. but it's generally the, the, the juice isn't going to be worth that squeeze. Mm -hmm. It's going to be annoying. Hmm. Okay. So the folks that are doing amazing and everybody's doing amazing actually, because we're just working so hard right now as real right. estate agents. But if you do hit over the 75, you, what is something quick that you would recommend that real estate agent to do? So you would, you would look into setting up an LLC, single member LLC, uh, multi-member LLC if you've got partners. Uh, then you would elect a 2553, a form 2553, it's an S-Corp election. Then you would put in a couple of different strategies like an accountable plan or capitalization policy. Capitalization, capitalization policy is very important because it actually allows you to elect a higher capitalization amount. So traditionally, if you buy something over $500 for your business, mm -hmm. you have to capitalize it, right? You have to depreciate it over a certain period of time, most okay. likely five or seven years. A capitalization policy allows you with unaudited financial statements to raise that limit to 2,500 per item, not per invoice, per item on the invoice. So you could actually write all of that information off, right? Hmm. Then if you're not tracking it, chances are, if you ever got rid of that product, you probably don't have a depreciation recapture because you never depreciated it in the first place. You got to write it off per IRS rules. Interesting. There's a lot, which means there like is. Monty referenced at the beginning well, is teaming up with true professionals that, you know, can navigate, you know, through all, you know, and, and again, as we're talking for you personal, you know, your personal taxes, but remember your clients, the lender can only use taxable income, right? And so when talking to the customers, it, I don't, is it a hard thing just to say taxes are good? Like you've, you've filed your taxes or you W2, like for you as a real estate agent? Yeah, I don't think about it because I just defer everything to my mortgage professional to mm -hmm. ask, you know, because we're busy trying to connect and bond and so forth. But, you know, we, you know, I shared yesterday's call that, hey, if you hear something that doesn't sound right, let's make sure we're. Yeah, only because they that. tell you things that they don't tell us. Right, is where, right. And so sometimes you pick right. up what they're putting down, you know, a little bit more sometimes. <clears> but, you know, making sure that they do file, you know, their taxes, not until the last second. Now, we are so lucky at CMG being a direct lender that we're able to allow them to pay their tax bill at time of closing, mm -hmm. um, where some people are required to already have it paid and then you're snail mailing it or you're waiting for, you know, the, the IRS, <clears> which, you know, can be delayed, yeah, which you can appreciate. <laughs> uh, so I'll put it to you this way. Last year, about March, the IRS shut down their tax practitioner hotline. Many people don't know this, but CPAs have a direct line access to the IRS. Okay. It usually hmm. takes us about 15 minutes to get through to an kind agent. Kind of like a bat line, I guess. <laughs> kind, of, kind of just like that, <laughs> except for Batman in this situation is the villain. Oh, that's right? true. <laughs> and so, line of the villain. <laughs> so, so for us, it usually- So the Joker's on the other side. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So it usually takes us about 15 minutes to get through to somebody, which means that I can wrap up a problem for a client within about 20 minutes, mm -hmm. right? As long as I got everything in place. The POA, everything needed, right? Uh, last year, they shut that line down for about eight months. Wow. So nobody could get through, wow. right? If we did get through, we'd be on hold for about an hour and then the line would go dead. No, holy right? And that, that was just outrageous. So what you had last year was a perfect storm of the IRS not being available and clients ending up with tons of capital gain from a, a robust market mm -hmm. and robust this year right. uh, crypto gains, right? Right. And so Should've it's, been, it's been an <laughs> insane last couple of months and most mm. people did not expect the tax liability they had this year. Most mm. of them had no clue their gains were that high. I don't know if that's a oh. financial advisor was just not open and honest and hey, we sold your stock, you had this much of a gain. Um, I don't know what happened there. There was a disconnect somewhere, but that's that's the landscape. I think it goes back to the money story from the beginning. <laughs> I just made all this money. You yeah. know, like this is exciting. Well, we forget I, we have to pay tax on that money. I, I think I spent most of this tax season assuring clients that their 2019 or 2020 refund they expected was on its way. Now some, they, they started trickling in. Wow. Uh, the IRS at the beginning of the year said, hey, you know, we're 6 million tax returns behind from 2019 and 20. An internal audit r revealed there were 24 million tax returns behind for that same time mm, period. That's insane. Not only that, but an article came out not that long ago, uh, I believe it was accounting today, they revealed that the taxpayer or taxpayer advocates office did a review in March of 2021, the IRS shredded 30 million tax documents because they couldn't process them in time. Wow. Mm -hmm. So clients started getting tax notices that said, hey, we had your, your amended tax return and we show that it was here, but we can no longer find it. Can you mail us a new copy? 
these were legitimate notices that went out to clients and they're they're asking us like we know and we're just like you know what <laughs> Uh, we wow. can call, but we're likely not going to get through. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, right now, it's a waiting game, and I've I've had some clients that call me weekly. Hey, where's mm -hmm. where's my amendment at? Where's my amendment? You're, you got the same tools I got available right, right now. So. And that's the reason why some lenders do wait for the 4506, the transcripts to, mm -hmm. to come back. Usually mm -hmm. with self-employed, we do make that exception. You were referencing, you know, it's a better strategy to get the payment letter, which mm -hmm. is a great thing. From a However, cash yeah. yeah, but from from just so you guys know, you know, you would have to get an interview with the IRS downtown. And if you can't, we had customers drive to St. Louis because that was the first opportunity that they wow. could get because they wanted to close on their house and not bring so much to closing for the tax liability. So mm -hmm. it is, it's, it's an important topic. We're just so very grateful, yeah. Mike, that you were able to join us. There's One so much more. One yeah. more quick question. Sure. I'm sorry. But before we before we wrap this up, the other day on our huddle call, somebody, not huddle call, but our, our group me app, somebody asked, what is the allowable? And maybe you, know, maybe you don't know this answer. I think you probably do. What can a realtor give in, a, in the form of a gift in, a, in the amount as far as IRS is concerned? $25 per client. That's what gift. I thought. That was mm -hmm. $25 a client is all we can give. Mm -hmm. okay. Insurance, too. Mm -hmm. Okay. Just wanted to clarify that. There was uh, several people And then the other that. question we get a lot, since we're on the topic of gift, um, do you want to share the tax um, hit for someone to give a gift? So, you know, if I was to give a gift to my mom to oh. buy a home, right? A lot of people are like, no, I don't want to do that because I'm going to get taxed. So I think there's, you have to communicate to the IRS that you gave a gift, but you don't get hit for a tax liability. Li li um, liability <laughs> until, I was, I don't know what I was saying, liability until you have so much money in your, in your um, um, estate. So, so what you're hitting on is actually a common misconception with mm -hmm. the gift tax, right? So you can give, anybody can give any other person $15,000 a year, okay. right? free, right? Okay. And it doesn't come off your annual or your lifetime gift tax exclusion. Your lifetime gift tax exclusion is $11 million per taxpayer right now. Okay. Mm -hmm. So if you wanted to give, let's I can say give $11 million okay. over your lifetime for well, free lifetime. and nobody pays the, but you, I don't have $11 million. <laughs> it's, <laughs> after, it's after tax. Money, I want to be in the will. <laughs> so, so you will have already paid taxes on that. Uh -huh. But as long, as long as you're under that amount, I the see. IRS isn't going to tax whoever you give it to. I got you. Right. Uh, wow. So let's say you want to give, Sixty thousand dollars, sure. right, to your son for or daughter for purchasing uh, a home. Uh, purchasing a home. Mm -hmm. How can we navigate that, right? Because over fifteen thousand, what it does is it triggers a gift tax return, right? No taxes are due. Right. What it is is it's a running tally of how much you have left of your eleven million. So hmm. the first fifteen is free, and then the rest of that comes off your long term exclusion mm -hmm. amount, right? And so if you ever die with 11, 11 million or more. The IRS is going to go through your records, mm -hmm. find out how much you gave away during your lifetime, and that's going to come off your total. And then whatever's left, if it's under that that or if it's over that amount, the rest is taxed on your estate mm -hmm. over eleven million. And how do right. you know I gave? You know, as you my CPA, how do you know I gave sixty thousand dollars to my children? You're going to have a uh, a, a bank draft of about sixty thousand dollars, right? Mm -hmm. And so I'm going to ask questions, or a good CPA would, right now. The right answer is you talk to your CPA before you give that money away mm -hmm. because the answer, the real answer to that is if your son is married and you're married, you and your husband can give $15,000 each to your son and then $15,000 each to his spouse, mm -hmm. $60,000 right there. And you avoided all the gift taxes. Hmm. Right, but again, we hear tax, we think money. What you're sure. saying is just, it's, we a have to, it's just a record. It's just the communication. And that's really a, a situation wow. that comes up on a regular basis. So it's good, wow. good yeah. knowledge. And again, so grateful for you. How does good one who, who wants to get their taxes done and needs a really good CPA, how do we get a hold of you? So, uh, and are you taking new clients? We are not taking new clients. <laughs> and that's the answer to that. <laughs> uh, we are, we are not, but I'll, I'll tell you if, if you stick to those three things that you want from a CPA, and you understand how a get or a tax strategy works, you're going to get the most out of your CPA, right? Invite them to the conversation. The less you use them, the less valuable they are. You're overpaying for a tax return right off the bat, right? So in any t any any tax strategy, there are three competing forces. You have cash flow, wealth building, and you have ca uh, uh, tax savings. Okay, now, it seems contradictory, right? Why would mm -hmm. tax savings have a direct correlation in a tax strategy? Because in any given year, one of those might be more important to you, right? Sure. So if we run any tax strategy through those three filters, what we're left with is 
the effect of what you're about to do and, and is that meeting what goal you have set? So let's take a 401k, right? If you put a 401k in place and you contribute $20,000 to it, what does that do to your wealth building? Jason? That's a lot of information I don't know. <laughs> well, the, the, the real answer is nobody knows, right? Yeah, right. Nobody because knows. if you, if, if you retire- That's a question. There you go. <laughs> the idea is that you're building your wealth, right? Because you're putting money back for your future. But the reality of it is that if you, if you retire in 07 versus 08, you either met your goal or you didn't, right? And it, wasn't, it didn't have anything to do with anything but the market at the time. Mm -hmm. So it's not a great barometer for where you're going to be in retirement. The, the real answer is set your retirement goal and then work towards getting to that, not just mm. throw money into a 401k bucket. But let's continue with the game, right? What, is ca what happens to cash flow in a 401k environment? You're reducing cash flow, right? You're putting it away. You're locking it away in an sure. account that you can't touch without being penalized. Mm -hmm. What happens to your tax savings? Goes up right? You save money because you took money out of your taxable income mm -hmm. bucket. What happens if you buy a vehicle? What happens with your wealth building if you buy a vehicle? It affects that. Most likely it's going down, right? Unless you're in an industry, you need a vehicle to produce cash, right? Mm -hmm. If you're in a trucking industry, sure. buying a new vehicle is a very good thing. You're turning rubber into cash, right? Mm -hmm. uh, same thing with cash flow. Unless you're in an industry that requires a vehicle, your cash flow is going down because you had to come out the money mm -hmm. on, either in your pocket or from the bank, right? right. Loans are great because they're non-taxable, but somebody has to pay the piper at some point. Uh, from a tax savings standpoint, sure, you might get a benefit for that in the taxable year. And if you have a high income year, an $80,000 write-off is a pretty good, a pretty good situation, right? Let's take something like a rental property. You guys are in real estate. You understand how real estate has impacted people's lives over the long term. Real estate actually is the only vehicle I'm aware of that hits all three in a positive manner, mm -hmm. right? You're building wealth because all right. in the history of mm -hmm. the United States, the wealthiest families come from building businesses or owning tons of land, mm -hmm. right? Property appreciation is going to be a naturally occurring phenomenon for our, our lives for, for forever. Mm -hmm. uh, cash flow, if you're not getting more rent than expenses, you're doing it wrong. You need out of that asset anyway. You didn't buy the right asset or you don't manage it properly. Either mm -hmm. way, it's just not the right tool for you. Mm -hmm. But it does have the ability to be tax efficient. It's taxed at ordinary income gains, right? So it's, it's taxed without self-employment. It's passive income is what they call it. So it can hit all three and, and impact all three in a positive manner. So Always look at your what, whatever your CPA tells you through those three lenses, and look for those three qualities we talked about for a CPA, and you're going to be you're going to be in the right spot. And then, is there a certain category if wow. I own like you own some properties? You know, you own some extra properties. It's a real estate professional category or something. Ah, I love that question. So there are three ways you can qualify in real estate as far as a rental property go. The first. You're not a you're not a participant. You simply bought the property. Somebody else manages it. Somebody else does everything. Right? You didn't mm -hmm. pick the management company. It just came the way it is. Generally, you can write off up to three thousand dollars against that activity, and that's it. Right? Of losses. Excuse me. If you are a material participant, here's the beauty of this: to to reach the material participant, you simply have to choose the management company. You just have to choose. And can it be right? your wife or husband? It can be whoever you want. But there is a very very key strategy into making it your wife or husband. Mm -hmm. we'll, we'll talk about that on the next category. Okay. <laughs> so material participant would allow you to write off up to $25,000 against your other income. Now that is phased out when you start making 100,000 as a household or 150 total, it's completely phased out. Hmm. You'll get the same 3,000, the rest will be offset to the next year or until you sell the property and then it'll either offset next year's rental income and then offset another 3,000 or if you sell that property, it'll unlock all those losses and it'll come off the capital gains taxes you'll pay when you sell that property. Okay. The third category is uh, is your real estate professional. So this is a very unique uh, category. Most realtors are gonna meet this because you have to have your primary activity in a real estate field. Now this isn't good enough to just be a loan originator on a W-2, you actually have to have your own business within the real estate industry. So usually if you work two different jobs, you just have to be able to prove that the majority of your time is spent in, in real estate or rental activity, mm -hmm. right? If you can do that and you can prove that, or if you make your husband or spouse who's to stay at home, a husband or wife, uh, if, if you make them uh, the manager of the property and that's their only activity, mm -hmm. well, they already meet it, right? Mm -hmm. So at least half of that activity now is gonna be unlocked. If you put the entire property in their name, now all of it's unlocked. Right. Right. So that's, that's great. Wow. Um, and uh, yeah, so- and what mean, does that do for me being that in that? completely unlocks your, your losses for the year. 
Yeah, it's uh, it's usually a better strategy if you have a lot of commercial properties, a lot of single family residences just aren't gonna have enough losses that are, mm. it's gonna make a huge impact to your bottom line unless you have 30, 40 properties. Good stuff. Yeah. Good stuff. Wow. Great. Wow. Thanks, we'll Mike. Take I think my, my, brain hurt, my brain hurts yeah. after all that, man. <laughs> do you have anything else you'd like to say as I do a take two to um, close this story down? No, no. I think, this uh, is great. I think that's great. I'd, Thank you, Mike. I'd love to be back anytime you guys have additional questions or if, if you see something in your industry that's just being impacted by the tax effect, let me know. Love that. Love great knowledge um, and especially learning all things wow. CPA with a very talented Mike Carter. So thank you so much. Thank you for joining us. You've been listening to the talk of Music City Real Estate.